Hey, everybody. I'm Erin Patrice, and this is Hey Bay City. Erin, in our last conversation, which was so good, by the way. Yeah. I don't know if you loved it, but I I loved it. (laughs) (laughs) I did. So, people, if you didn't listen to the episode one with Erin, Go back and listen to it because it it just, it really lays the groundwork for this really incredible series that you're bringing to us here in Bay City through the help of Bay Area Community Foundation. And I'm looking forward to it so much. So if you haven't listened to episode one, either listen to this episode all the way through and then go back and listen to it or go back, hit pause right now, go back and listen to it and then listen to this one because it really is important to get some of the context here because you like... If, if you don't understand the context, you could be like, so you're getting a bunch of people in a room and you're having a conversation. Yeah. Like, Heck yeah, we are. And it's going to be amazing. Yeah. You, at the start of the pandemic, started to have these really critical conversations with people. And we talked about a, little, a, a couple of them in that, that first episode. When did this idea for the Including You series, this really intentional event community series come to be you? I guess it will go back to our first live show. So we had done about a year, I think, of online conversations. And I actually was talking to someone and just said, hey, I want to bring our season back in. I'm trying to think of a cool way to do it. And she just randomly said, how about you do the live show? And I was like, oh, that's a good idea. I would love that. Did not even really cross my mind. And so we did a first one and we were not able to do all of our topics in that couple hours that we were there. Yeah. and Because we, we like to overshoot. We're like, we, we're going to talk about five topics. Yes. And then an hour and a half later, you're still on number one. Yes. And it just got so good. And people were like, oh, my goodness, we have to do another one because it was so good. Mm-hmm. And so we did a second one like a month later. We just re- did another one. And after that, uh, actually, it was the Midland Area Community Foundation. Someone from there came to me and said, hey, we really like what you're doing. Let's talk. And so that's how it started. And I was thinking because I said, what do I want to call this? How do I want to do this series? Right. Because I always find that one conversation is great. Right. You can have a great conversation with somebody at a bus stop and you feel like you just changed your life. And but I said, wonder if we have topics where we can grow with each other. Right. So if somebody comes to the first one, my hope is that they come to the sixth one or the fifth one and grow with me. We're all growing together. So that's where the including you came from. I said, I like things to be pretty simple, right? It's, I don't want this overcomplicated topic or umbrella, right, mm-hmm. to these conversations. I said, including you. If we want change, we want growth, we want to build community, it includes all of us. And I just thought to myself, and that includes you, me, we, all of us. So that's how that came I, to be. I, I love the idea of, of it being a, a, a series where I, I can go to the first event, but then I'm going to want to go to the second event because it's different people and different topics, but still as applicable to those folks up on the stage as it is to me. And, and it is very much a, like a package deal. It's not just, well, I'm really interested in that topic, but I'll never go to another one of these. So you, everybody can benefit from all of them. So maybe break it down all the way for me. If if nobody has, if somebody hasn't seen you before and sure. they don't know anything about what this event looks like. Yeah. Imagine I'm walking into the auditorium or the Pier Marquette station and I'm seeing it for the first time. What am I going to see when I come to an including you event? It is a whole vibe. It's a whole experience. <laughs> yeah. And because it's funny because when you study the science of all of our five senses, right? When you tap into more than one, is something that happens with the brain, right? And also, I will add that growing up, dinner time or when we had like holiday dinners, it was always so joyous, right? Everybody came. Nobody cared if somebody was like a doctor or a janitor. Like nobody cared about that. We all just got together. And even a lot of times too, look, if you're... I have a tense relationship with a family member yeah. and things are weird or maybe you had a fight three months ago that you didn't really resolve, Like at least for that day. For that moment, yeah. Everybody tries to put down their swords as much as they can. Now that I'm not speaking for every family, obviously, sure. you have Thanksgiving dinners that get really weird. <laughs> or, or people are not no longer invited to them. Yeah. But for the most part. Yeah, for the right? most part, a lot of folks, like they understand that this is a moment. 
put down our swords. Let's eat some food. Yeah. And so that was important to me to have to incorporate that concept of the breaking bread. And not only with, I think, just culturally and just even when I was growing up religiously, right, like different practices, it always surrounded meals, right, that breaking of bread. And it was almost like a truce. And you just say, we are all equal here. We all can play a part. So when people come in, they're going to see where well, they're going to hear music. We always have live music. That is the plan to always have some type of live entertainment that we call Very our cool. pre-show. Yeah, because for me anyway, music is just everything. It just sets a tone. It sets a precedent of what to, just like the vibe when you come yeah. in. Opens people up a little bit too. It's not yeah. like you're walking into this a, li quiet. a library. How yeah. dare you speak before this? Exactly. Event. Even yeah. though technically when you come to Millie, you will be walking into a library. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then into the auditorium. Yeah, but yeah. yes, but yes, it's that idea that we're all just chill here. It's just to make it as cool and easy as possible because we already know that discussing certain topics is hard mm -hmm. for some people, right? So why add on to that? So what we try to do is take away that jitter, that um, anxiety from it and just allow people to chill. So yeah, you have the music, uh, our team is absolutely fantastic. They greet people at the door. They greet people in the lobby. They greet you. And we just are a vibe. And I know everybody says that about their people, but I have a good group of people that work with me. And I can't imagine working with you and not being a vibe. Oh. <laughs> Thing is a prerequisite for being a part of the team. <laughs> and, and you know what? And that is something that I communicate, right? That we, yeah. that anybody that comes here should feel welcome. Mm -hmm. And if you can't do that, then maybe this isn't for you. And that's okay because I don't want anybody to ever come in and feel like they don't belong there because that's the whole premise of what we do is that you can come in here. And then really the foundation of a great conversation, you, you need you two people at least have to approach each other in a way that says you are welcome into this space. Yes. You're, you're safe here. We can be vulnerable here. Not necessarily setting the tone of we have to agree on everything. Sure. And as long as you're playing with me, I'm going to play with you. But you come into this space together where you can say for the next two minutes, yeah, 30 minutes, three hours, whatever it ends up being, like we're going to play this really experiential game of communication where yeah. we get to do something that is not just fun and not just edifying but it's foundational to us as a human yeah and so you have to set that tone of this is an open space where you feel welcome where you can be safe where you can express yourself yeah and you're valued right yep. we, we appreciate yep. you being here and it's so interesting i always tell even the panelists don't come here and because what i found is that some people will come and then be different so no, oh, yeah, I, I yeah. asked you to come here because I want you to be you. That was the whole point. I saw something in you that I thought would bring value to this conversation. So don't switch up on me. Be who you are. And I think that's the, and sometimes it's just maybe cameras or being in front of people, but. An unfamiliar situation. Yes. And, and people are curious to say, okay, is this really a safe space? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think that what makes us a little bit different is that. We use safe space a lot, right? We say safe space a lot, but it's not really always safe, right? If a person really does not align with the the culture of whatever group they're yes. coming to speak to or with. And with us, it's totally different, in my opinion, right? We really want everyone. Mm -hmm. And that means the conservative, the uh, religious person, whoever, right? I, I just use throw these things out, left all of that. I want all of it. And yeah. yeah. I, I, I love your use of the word safe space. And just to clarify for the people that are listening, using it in the way of it is a safe space. There's no political baggage there. Dump all of that. These are two words that are important to every single person. A space where you feel safe to be able to express what you value. And I love that about you and, and your work that, it, and we, we can maybe get into this a little bit later. Sometimes people chafe at that a little bit. Is yeah. we, well, I really don't agree with so, and so they should not be given a platform. Oh, people actually say that. Though. Yes, I they, know. They, I've, they've said it to me. Do you want to talk about that? We, yeah, I'm, yeah, I mean, let, I'm open book. Yeah, let's talk about it. Because it, it's not all necessarily feel good and rainbows. Yeah. It's also a confrontation. And that's part of the growth that happens. But I'll let you, I'll let you talk about it. What, what, what would you say to people who might leave an event having heard opinions from people that they really strongly disagree with and then 
look at the event as, well, you should not have invited XYZ person because of the values they hold. What would you say to somebody? My, my answer always is, have you paid attention to what we do? Seriously. I'm, I'm, I have never hidden behind that. I've never tried to make it sound something. I've always been very clear. That is the intention of what we do. I always challenge whoever, right? First, I apologize if you don't didn't feel what you felt, but I also challenge people to search within, right? Because all this work, when I say including you, all this work is about self-awareness, all of it. It's not about the other people, it's you, it's me, right? Mm. If you felt challenged, uncomfortable for whatever reason, that's something you have to search within about because the reality is that no matter where you go, to the grocery store, to church, to um, your job, to the coffee shop, there are going to be people that do not feel the same way as you. And you have to learn how to navigate through life with those different viewpoints. Mm. And that's what we're that's what we're doing. So I can give you a, a perfect example. We had a show that we did agree to disagree. That was the topic. And I invited a gentleman by the name of Ryan Kelly to come. He ran for governor as a Republican. And he was, you all could look him up. <laughs> you would know everything about him, right? He's very uh, transparent about who he is. He's very far. Okay, I'll just put it that way. Mm. And I was very clear that he would be invited. Him and I met online Back in 2020, he was in the news about different things. Mm -hmm. This is when all the statue stuff was going on. People were trying to keep or get rid of statues. And so we met, talked to him, and conversation went well. We had things we agreed on, some things we didn't. And so I invited him because I always want a conservative view, if I can find one. And he agreed to come. He drove from Grand Rapids area, right? So that's about an hour and a half drive, maybe two, depending on where. Yeah, I was going to say probably two, yeah. Yes. And he was willing to come. You know, I didn't pay him anything or anything like that. And I was really appreciative of him coming in. And I remember people were very upset. Like they they told me they were upset. They didn't think he should be there that because of what he did. And he also was aligned with some of the stuff that happened January 6th. So people just thought that, why would you give him a platform? And I'm like, I'm not giving him anything. He has a platform. He literally has thousands of people that follow him, right? I'm not giving him anything. What I'm doing is, for me, being true to what I said I'm going to do. Mm. I'm a very clear person about things like that. And I don't um, hide away from my truth, right? And so he came. Um, some people were upset. And I remember the next day, as I put up my appreciation post, Someone commented and said, I'll never forget this because it was so interesting to me, especially coming from the person that it was. And if they hear this, I'm sorry, but it was a public right, it's right, right. Public happened, a public um, thing that happened. So anyway, they wrote that they really appreciated me having people from all over the Great Lakes Bay region to represent and to speak, except for the other. Mm. And I remember that the other part. And that really stuck out to me because I, if anybody knows me, knows I do, I do not go back and forth on social media. You rarely see me post anything except for a thank you. I respond to what other people say. I don't do a lot of comment commenting, and but I felt need like I needed to do that because I needed to help people understand the authenticity of the work that we do. So I said I will always invite the others. I've been an other, mm -hmm. right? People have considered me an other. So I will always invite people that do not necessarily align with the norm in that space because he can go somewhere else and people will celebrate him. That's the beauty of this is that our personal views or perspectives do not answer everything. They're not the, the end all be all because in our little part of the world, we may feel very enraged by this person somewhere else. He might be considered like a king, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that's the part we we think that we have so much. I hate to use the word power, but we feel like we have so much power that our voice, right, our one voice, can shut someone else down. Mm. And we shouldn't. For me personally, I don't try to do that. So, what, from your perspective, what is the benefit to me, or what is the opportunity presented to me, sitting in a room and and listening? to somebody who I vehemently disagree with. It's growth, right? 
I've had people tell me things that they don't agree with. And this is just in my life, right? Mm -hmm. I have to learn. I had to learn how to receive what people consider criticism, right? When really it's just someone's viewpoint. We take it in as a negative instead of saying, how can I use this as fuel? How can I use this as a planted seed to have something grow within me, right? Even if it's just a matter of growing patience, right? To be able to sit through a conversation or something that you're listening to and not be, I know we like to use the word triggered, mm -hmm. right? By everything. If we are so easily moved by everything, what are we really standing for? It's interesting you say that. This morning I, I saw a quote, a Marcus Aurelius quote, and that sounds very pretentious. I'm sorry, guys. Yeah. But I saw this Marcus Aurelius quote, and, and, and his point was, if someone says something to you or does something to you, and you, and you feel wounded by it, that's a choice that you make. It is. And so you can ch also choose to make the other choice and not feel wounded. And he ends it with, and if you don't feel wounded, you aren't. And I think that applies so well to what you're saying in that if that that to learn that skill of yeah. not feeling wounded that takes experience that takes yeah. exposure that takes receiving a piece of criticism or hearing an idea that you don't like responding to that and making a choice about that and if we make better responses and better choices to those things we are better human beings yeah. with better relationships, who function better in the world, who communicate better with people, who can make more effective and better change. There's so many opportunities there. and That's the word, opportunities. Yeah, and I love this idea of you presenting us with this opportunity to say, to experience that in whatever, it might be agreement, but it also might be disagreement. And yeah. then I'm confronted with how do I... Like, how do I manage that? I, there's so many correlations between your work and uh, one of our mutual for friends in Saginaw, Kevin Jones, yeah, from Black Teaking. And and yeah. if you people, if you don't know his work, you need to. We've got a podcast rolling out with him soon. He has a museum uh, coming. Help him. Yeah, help him in the museum because he's absolutely brilliant. And I yeah. I remember when I walked in to his first pop up, Black Teaking in Saginaw, and you walk into this room with three thousand artifacts antiques, pieces of art, all of these things mm -hmm. from the black experience, ranging from the most beautiful things that you've seen to the absolute most racist things that you've seen. Mm -hmm. And I remember walking into that room and being challenged in a way that I, I could never have been, not on the internet, not anywhere else, but you walk into the room and you have this experience of, okay, I, this is a point of decision. How do I feel about this? Yeah. What do I think about this? Do I think it's right? Do I think it's wrong? All of these things, and I walked out of there changed in ways that I, I, don't, I still don't really know yeah. because I had this opportunity to be confronted with something like that. And so I think that's a beautiful thing about your work in that we have seven people, however many people on stage saying, hey, this is what I believe and it, for us in the audience, it's a moment of choice and a moment of decision and yeah. a moment of opportunity to say, like, how would I respond to this question? Yeah. Have I really thought about what I think deep enough to be convicted about what I think? Am I just going through life saying, I think this, so it must be true. The end. Yeah. Um, and it, so it's a really beautiful opportunity. Yeah, I appreciate that. I love being challenged, right? I, I and I think about when people are in relationships, we're all in relationships, really, but like you have a partner, you don't always agree with everything. You have to right. learn how to talk through it. You have to, or what's the other alternative, divorce or separation? Yeah. You have to learn how to coexist. And what's funny, as you were right before you were saying that, I was thinking about talking about the N word, right? Mm -hmm. And with me being black, People like to use that sometimes as a way to get to me or make me upset. And this is nothing against people who get upset by it because rightfully so. I don't. Mm -hmm. Only because I refuse to give someone that kind of power to be able to speak a word and it turns my whole life around. I'm not doing that. So when people try to use that as some type of weapon against me, you can't because I've, I, I took that away from you. So to me, it's the same thing sometimes with people. When they say things to, because some people say stuff to get you, you have to take control over that. And again, back to the N word, right? Rightfully, people should be upset, right? I choose not to only because 
I know they're saying it to change me, right? Shift me. And I just, I can't allow that. So again, I had to ask myself, even though the word is a terrible word, do I want to allow that to have so much power over me for the rest of my life that anytime someone even whispers it, hmm. I just become enraged and just crazy or just, no, because because I'm not that. Right. So I had to say to myself, you're not that. So I choose not to respond that way. I, I admire that because your opinion comes from a place of a decided personal value. Yeah. That, that this is something in my life that I value, and therefore I'm going to act in a way that is aligned with that. And I think that's so beautiful. And it, look, speaking of beautiful things, I don't want to give people listening the impression that these conversations are designed to be controversial. No. Or, or like you're going to go to a series and grab your popcorn, people. There's going to be fireworks. Because most of the time, it, it's incredibly beautiful conversations. And you yeah. get to explore these topics that we that are so important to our everyday lives and we feel compelled to. But we don't. you don't really sit, sit down and say... Hey, can we have a sixty-minute conversation about integrity? Like you just—you don't have those opportunities. Yeah. It, it, over the the course of last year's work in Midland, do you remember a conversation or a moment that was especially beautiful or impactful or or positive or uh, anything that just moved you in that direction? It's really interesting because the conversations are always good. Like I, I really do enjoy them, and we've never really had anybody just get crazy mm -hmm. on, on the stage like never have had that and i'm thankful which is great which is amazing people i communicate what i expect yeah. and that's just respect yeah. that's it and then people honor it and it's, it's really been that simple I, th I, I think that's amazing sorry to interrupt i just want to point out because you would get the impression on social media mm -hmm. that as soon as somebody says something that somebody might disagree with that immediately the show is over and people are throwing microphones and how dare you you would get the impression from social media that would be the reaction but here in person it, it's not because people are approaching it with respect yeah. And I and, and again, it all goes with these are progressive movements, right? Mm -hmm. These are building blocks. So we don't just get something together and just throw it out there. It's curated, right? We approach it with love and from the beginning to the very end. Mm -hmm. And so when you ask about moments, the moments really for me have been what I call the after, right? I have these pictures and these testimonials that I consider the after because really, the conversation is great. Like, I, I love it. We, we all have a good time. But it's those after moments that really have sealed the deal for me. This is working, mm. right? This is really something that we can be proud of as not only an organization, but a community, right? Because I've had agree to disagree. There was a lady came there. She wrote me a couple of days later, and she had not spoken to her brother since 2020 because of who he was voting for president. And after that show, she told me she decided to reach out to him, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe visit with him. That is success, right? We've had panelists that would never sit down with each other because of what they feel on different opposite ends of the spectrum that have met up for coffee afterwards and mm -hmm. keep talking, right? Or follow each other on social media to get to know each other more. That is success. So for me, it's about the seed planting, Right. Because a lot of times we have these events. It goes well. We're like, yes. And I always say, yes, I'm excited. I'm proud of my team. I'm like, oh, my goodness. But it's the after moments that I get later that people privately write me. Mm -hmm. Right. They don't put it out and pub publish it. Or maybe I'll ask them, do you mind if I share this? I don't have to say your name. Right. Mm -hmm. But that those are the moments that I find um, a lot of pride in. I get a little emotional about it because you have dreams right and you say oh this is possible but when you see the connections that people make or the epiphanies that go on within that they share or talking to their mother again that is some deep stuff right and it's not anything that I'm doing it's the whole it's the whole experience of being able to be somewhere and just share and then the audience members get to sit there and listen and reflect themselves. I've had people there that were 89 years old. A lady there was 94. She wanted me to know she was 94 and how much she enjoyed it. Mm. And I've had children there. A lady wrote me and said, can I bring my young children? Please do. And they came and she said, typically they're all over the place. They listen. And then on the way home and once they got home, they kept asking questions about, mm. oh, what about this? What about this? 
that is success. So it's, sometimes it's hard when people say, how do you measure? Mm -hmm. How do you measure? That's how I measure it. And so, yeah. yeah. How do you put, my life is different because of this experience onto a spreadsheet? <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So that is a success for me. Wow, beautiful. Yeah. I have so much respect for this work because a lot of times in, in my work, I have these incredible conversations with yeah. people. Like yeah. these, these people that are have been members of a community for decades and they may never have ha been able to tell their story. Yeah. And I'm sitting in their back kitchen on a stool and they're telling me this stuff and m just absolutely blowing my mind. And I walk out of those conversations so many times thinking, I wish that 50 people were here yeah. watching that. Their, yeah. their neighbors or their fellow business owners or folks from the government. Like th I wish they could have sat here and Because it's the energy. Yes. It's the energy. And yep. that's the thing. is That's why I tell people, yes, you can watch them on YouTube after we've done it, right, and published it. You can hear about it via a podcast or yep. via someone else's word of mouth. But being there is the beauty, right? Because you feel it when you're there, right? And people stay after. I have to kick people out, Phil. I have to tell people, <laughs> look, y'all, we got to go. We only booked this for two hours. Yes, so and my beautiful it. friend, the guy that, that that maintains the building after we leave, yeah. he just, he, bless his heart, he just looks at me and he like peeks his head in. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But people stay and they want to talk. They Then they move it outside. Yeah. And I tell people, okay, y'all can be outside as long as y'all want. I'm going. Like, I got to go. <laughs> but, yeah, that's the beauty in it. Yeah. It's a kind of energy that you can only experience in person. Yeah, with other people. There's no replacement for it. There's. I love how you pointed out. You can watch stuff on YouTube or you can see it posted on the internet. But you, there will never be any sort of replacement for the magic that can happen when you're sitting across from somebody in a room yeah. and having a conversation with yeah. them. A, a very open, vulnerable, safe conversation. It is absolutely one of the most important experiences in a person's life. And the sad thing is a lot of us go through most of our lives never having that, never experiencing yeah. that. Some of us don't even know that we're robbing ourselves of it because we're so infatuated with the internet or we're so infatuated with conflict or we're so infatuated yeah. with these yeah. things and we never really give ourselves this opportunity to to sit down and ex have that kind of experience it, it's one of the most amazing things yeah it's interesting i always think about because growing up in inner city like I caught the bus a lot so we would catch the bus sometimes to school we catch the bus downtown wherever and i just remember those conversations i would have with the lady at the bus stop mm -hmm. right or the gentleman at the bus stop, and you don't know each other. I don't know her name is Dorothy, mm -hmm. right? I don't know she's a single mom. I don't know him, right? I don't know anything about him, that he's on his way to a work, a job, that he's going to work for 13 hours. We just talk, and that is how I wanted to feel when you come to one of our shows. We don't put up bios. People have asked me that. over and over again, like, you should do that. Nope, I never will. I won't. And there's a reason why I don't. Tell me why. So just like those conversations that you have at the bus stop, it's authentic because there's no presumption, right? There's no, you don't have to live up to anything, right? If I'm a CEO or if I'm, I have a PhD, the person at the bus stop doesn't care. We, we are both on the same bus, yep. right? Same thing in life. We're all journeying through this together. So if I, if someone, say for instance, I have someone come on that is the DEI adjunct professor at SVSU, right? And somebody, I put out their bio, they have their doctorate, they have all these different things. Someone coming that, that I may have invited that's conservative or see things a different way that does not even believe in DEI, right? Will already have a judgment about this person. Right. We already judge people by what we look like, right? So we do that. So I can't help with that. I can't right. make people walk in with blindfolds on, right? Right. right. But I can take off that part of it. And mm -hmm. I just never will do it. I, I want people to come as Dave. I want people to come as Phil. You're just Phil. Now, people know you. They know you, right? right? And then also, if you look up someone's name, you could probably figure it out. When I announce our panelists, it's just their first name. I don't put mm -hmm. a last name. 
I don't put any, because that's just Laura, right? And I want Laura also to feel comfortable to come as Laura and not feel like she has to live up to her title. Because we all walk around with these titles and we feel like we have to live up to them. And then that's when the authenticity kind of yeah. plays a back seat, right? I yeah. think that's so great because it, it it's so beneficial for both the audience and the person. Like you said, if you're throwing your bio out there and you're a certain person with yeah. a certain thing, it's going to contribute to this feeling. Like I have to go in. With and this I, hat on. Yeah, with this hat on and I have to play that role as opposed yeah. to being yourself. And then from the audience perspective, I love that because you, you have this list of bios and immediately what you're thinking is, I don't want to listen to that person well, or yes. I want to listen to that person. And now you're throwing all of this extra thing, all this stuff on top of it when you need to be there to hear what they have to say, yes. not based on what you think they're going to say. Exactly. And that's the thing yeah. is that if I have a panelist that I prefaced it with, oh, she's an evangelical, right? Mm-hmm. Conservative. People make assumptions about who she votes for, who she, all these different things. Yeah. This, wait a minute. I was talking to someone a couple months ago and he shared that he wanted to put up a American flag, right? Outside his house. And he said that he didn't do it. Told his wife, he's, I don't want people to think that I'm those people. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like a right wing type, mm-hmm. everything you think about, that's what he talked about. And I said, that's so interesting that you live in a country and you want to show pride for where you live but you're afraid to do it because of all the assumptions that come with it Mm -hmm. and you just we have this real black and white view of people like that if you align with this and you must align with all of this too it's not real right so Mm -hmm. i take all that away and and my hope that people can come and be in their true self take like when you go home for women we take off things to feel free right and then people (laughs) take off their shoes or whatever else and you just you just are there. You just, you, and I, that's how I want to be is I think about when you have friends over, right? And when you first start off, somebody may be eating dinner and uh-huh, drinking uh-huh. some wine or pops or whatever. And it's like you had that real surface conversation like, how was your day? How are the kids? How's the weather? Blah, blah, blah. But then once somebody had a couple glasses <laughs> of wine, yeah. right? People are full and yep. now snacking on like the candy and the junk food, right? People have taken their shoes off, put their feet up on the couch around midnight, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. It's That's when the real yeah. person comes out. Now we're having a conversation. Now we're having a conversation. And that's what I want people to feel like when they come, that if I could get couches as opposed to t- a, a, a chair, maybe sometimes to have people, I would. I just think that taking away all that stuff, mommy, daddy, the title of, like I said, the business owner, Get who cares, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Because at the end of the day, we're talking about bias, judgment. We're talking about societal expectation. Nobody cares about that stuff. Mm-hmm. Who are you as a person, right? And that's where the you part comes in. Who who are you? Yeah. Ah, beautiful. Speaking of, of conversations and talking about specific topics, I'm going to give people a little little sneak preview of the six show series that, that you're bringing to Bay City sure. next year. Number one. So talking about societal expectations. Number two, talking about bias and judgment. Number three, about empathy and tolerance. Four, honesty and transparency. Five, morality, ideology, and religion. And six, the greater good, the big picture. How do you go about choosing the topics for a show? What's that, what's that look like? My heart. Yeah. <laughs> I know that sounds kind of cliche but I yeah I don't know I just when I sat down and thought about that to me those build on each other right because Mm -hmm. the first one societal expectations I mean we all have that where people expect things out of us if we're a woman if we're a man if we're you know a mother if we're a grandmother if we're all these things right if we're a teacher they expect things out of us and that could become heavy Mm mm-hmm It can be hard to live up to all those expectations. So first we need to get to the root of stuff. Who are you? Because a lot of times when you follow societal expectations, you're not really following your Mm -hmm. heart, right? Mm -hmm. I remember I talked to a lady one time that she probably, I think was like 72, 73. And she shared with me that she always wanted a nose ring. But because her husband worked at Dow, she didn't think that she could show up Mm -hmm. to events with a little small nose ring. And I remember telling her like, wow. 
That is so deep to me. We were having a real in-depth conversation. And I said to think, you spent all these years denying yourself that because of what you think everybody else would think when they probably wouldn't even notice it. Yeah. And so, like, a, But we live our lives that way based on what other people would, may think about us. I From even growing up, I, I always wanted tattoos. And specifically, yeah. and my wife is going to cringe at this, but I don't care anymore. <laughs> I love you, wife. But I, I want two uh, sleeves. So mm -hmm. arms completely full of tattoos. Mm -hmm. And uh, from grade school that's what i wanted mm -hmm. but i knew that i wanted to be a teacher when i grew up and that mm -hmm. if i had something like that not only might i not might people look down on me as a teacher but i i was told in a lot of capacities both very explicitly and and just implicitly um that i may not even get a job if i had something like that yeah and well, and and I and I'm saying that because what I what I love about these this list of societal expectations and empathy and tolerance and honesty and morality that these are all topics that shape exactly who we are as a human. Every single day, you are going to wake up, and if you don't hit all six of these, you're going to hit four out of six, five out of six, multiple times every single day in every single relationship, like taking honesty with uh, your partner, honesty with your children, honesty with your employer, honesty with your coworkers, with hon yourself. honesty with yourself. I love that you put honesty with yourself. Like yeah. we confront this idea of honesty, whether or not to be honest. And if we are honest, how honest are mm -hmm. we willing to be? almost constantly throughout every single day, but we never sit down and think for even five minutes. And I'm judging myself in this as much as anybody. Like yeah. we never sit down and think for five minutes is, am I being honest with myself? Yeah. Am I being as honest as I need to be with my spouse or my children? And is there a good time to be dishonest, right? We yes. talk about that too. We talk about when is there a time? Is there a time, yep. right, to be dishonest or to bend the truth? And then you loop the idea of uh, session number five of morality in there. Yeah. If, if Immediately some people are saying, well, dishonesty is always wrong all of the time. And so now you're confronting this concept of morality is do i value honesty and morality more or do i value this more and well, I, let me yeah. give you this perspective Go. Phil. and this Go. is what Please i talked do. about when we did it in midland what was that last month we talked about honesty and transparency and someone did say you should always be honest there's no time to be dishonest and one of the panelists shared an example and so did i coming from a relationship that was violent there were times where i was dishonest right because i knew that being honest would result in war. Yeah. So there were times I was dishonest because it was survival for me, right? And a panelist brought up, you're in a, a, a classroom and a shooter comes in, right? And you are you don't know they're there. You run out and they say, is there anybody else in that room? And you say, no, it's 20 kids in there. Mm. But you say no because... That's survival, right? So that's the part that sometimes we have to think about because we always think about honesty in this real self-serving way. Right, right. But really, sometimes you have to think about what is dishonesty and what can it do or not do in that moment. So we talk about that too. I'm going to add one example to what you're saying just because I know that there's some folks listening and thinking you're arguing from the exception. Like, right. of course, in life or death situations, you would. Right. But in everything else, I think your point is that it that it lies on a spectrum. Further on the other side of the spectrum, what if lying or being dishonest helps your spouse in some way? Yeah. What if you're trying to save their feelings and you're trying to make oh, them feel good yes. about themselves? What about that? Yes. And then now I think that's, okay, now that's something that we can really confront and say, all of us have been in that situation. Oh, yeah. Like, what do you think about this? Oh, I tell my husband all the yeah. time, if I'm bloated that month... <laughs> And I ask you, does this look that make me look no, like I'm bloated? It's the dreaded, how does this dress look on me question? Yes. <laughs> like in that moment, I would love for you to say you look beautiful, right? Because yes. he may still feel that way. But no, you look fine. And even though I know 
hold it. And I may still change into something else. In that moment, I need to hear you say that, right? Yes, I want so, you to be dishonest with yes, me. Please yeah. lie. Please lie. Because if you say yes, it makes you look bloated. It's like, yeah, I love it. I love it. Can we talk about yeah. number three? Yeah. And because the word empathy mm-hmm. just it, it always it, that that's a word that has become such a big part of my life because yeah. when, when this work started for me four years ago and up until now I I look at that as the the biggest change that I've had in mm. myself and I would go so as far as to say before this work of conversation and interviewing and telling people stories yeah. I, I don't know if I had empathy. I don't know if I really did. Was I kind? Sure. Yeah. Was I nice to people? Sure. Was I understanding to people? Sure. But now, four years later, sitting across from somebody and, and feeling like crying because of their story yeah. or like feeling a part of myself injured because of something that they've gone yeah. through or, or just having my mind being blown like how did you experience that and you're still here doing this yeah. I, I don't think i had any kind of empathy talk to me about maybe talk to me about that why it, we take it in any direction you want it, why is empathy important how do you gain it from conversation why do you need to bring it as a panelist to these conversations talk to me about that I think one part is just what you said, that self-discovery, right? Because I think that people think that they get sympathy and empathy confused, right? And which is really easy, right? And But for empathy, for me, I think that, especially in 2020, right, I, I saw a lot of people that just were not nice. They just weren't nice. This was, oh, my goodness. And I remember something that really triggered it for me for, to be able to want to talk about that was, when the Ukrainian war started. I'll never forget this because at the same time, the gas prices were going up. We had a new president, like all this stuff was happening. And I remember people, and it was a political thing. So it was left and right going back and forth. And I remember the left was putting up this meme that just drove me absolutely nuts, okay? And it said, you don't get to complain about gas while there are people being bombed in the Ukraine. And I remember thinking to myself, like, mm. why do we have to measure who gets it and who doesn't? Why do we have to pick? If I give you some empathy, I can't give you any, right? Why do we have to do that? Why can't we say that is terrible? It sucks. It's horrible that people are being bombed and... I feel sorry for this person who can't afford to put gas in their car to get to work or especially with all these jobs right now we have that people use their cars for, right? right. Or taking their children to school. And so that really did something to me. And I said, what is this idea that we don't have enough Mm -hmm. to give, right, across the spectrum? Why do we have to pick and choose? Yeah, we look at it as this very limited resource that we also then – need to weaponize to further whatever idea or opinion we have yeah. out in the world. Like, I, I empathize with you. As long as... You agree with me on these 10 points, and then if you don't, then... Well, think about it with the pandemic. I, I remember that like it was yesterday. I think most of us have moments during that time that just stuck with us. And I remember people, and, and again, this was a lot of people on the left and I'm not picking on the left. I'm, these are just the stories that I'm remembering right now, but I just remember that sticking out. And I think it's because I grew up with a certain type of mindset. So I was around a lot more people that were on that side mm-hmm. than that were conservative. Yep. Okay. So maybe that's, um, it was a thing that I was so close to that. I paid a lot of attention to some of the stuff that they did. Cause I felt like I almost felt betrayed mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Right. Cause I'm like, Oh, you said you were the, good guys, right? And I remember, I will never forget this, someone ended up getting COVID and they were one of the people that refused to wear masks, get the, all that stuff, right? And I didn't say the word because some people, they like blank you out if you say the V word, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, they decided not to get that and ended up getting COVID, right? And I will never forget one of the people that I really admired. I admired this person and still do. In some ways, I remember they said, I hope they die. Mm. 
because they decided not to do this and they did it, all this stuff. So I hope they die. And I remember thinking, you really, that's really what you want. Mm -hmm. That's really, you really want this person to die. And that's where I started thinking. And it was just so many different things. I could tell a thousand stories about why empathy really stuck out to me. And, but I thought when we talk about including you, we talk about change, moving a community forward, having that type of connection. Empathy's got to play a part in that. Yeah. It has to. Talk to me more about this idea of the, these conversations and how they move a community forward. How do you feel that having these conversations at these events, and not just these events, but these kinds of conversations in our meetings and our one-on-one -on -one interactions, how do you feel that these kind of open, vulnerable, transparent, honest, deep conversations moves a community forward? We are a collective, but we're also individuals. So if each individual does their part to do that self-awareness work, right, that growth within themselves, we naturally are better people to be around, to get along with. And think about those times when you've had a conversation with someone that you really didn't know that well, but it just got deep, almost like heavy, right? And you walk away and you say, wow, even though that was so heavy, I feel good because not only did you listen to that person, you released some stuff too. And that's what I tell people. This is a give and receive type of thing. This is not just all take or all give. This is a, this is something that you have to be committed to when you come into that. I am going to not only receive, mm. but I plan to give and giving can look so many different ways. When you receive, you're receiving what that person saying. That means that you're actively listening. You're actually listening to what they have to say. You're taking it in. You're, giving it a moment to pause and process what they're saying, right? So you can really hear them and not just that surface talk, right? And then when you're giving, what you do is not only are you giving of yourself and your energy, but this helps you out in the community, mm. right? You may take something else and say, wow, something there really resonated with me. Let me take this forward. So it's these ripple effects. And I think that's the part that we miss. We look for these big grand expressions mm -hmm. and it's not always like that a lot of times it's those real small moments of either joy of gifting somebody something because of something that you heard that did something to you on the inside mm -hmm. i remember when i first got into community work yeah i was just i would relentlessly talk about these amazing local businesses that i absolutely love and sure. i still do yeah but i'll never forget a conversation I had with Jaime Azurieta. He's a friend of mine out in New Jersey, and he works with communities and businesses working on their storefronts and things yeah. like that. Yeah. And he's originally from South America and moved to New Jersey. And we were having this conversation about, it was around the time of COVID, about supporting local businesses. Yeah. And in the, I, I love what he, t he talked to me about because he was like, we, we have to be careful about how we promote and try to uplift our communities for example if there's a, a baker in town artisanal baker crafted like the finest bread that you can buy and it's nine dollars ten dollars for a small loaf of bread and then we come out as a community and we say look how amazing that is this is amazing bread it is amazing bread and they're doing amazing work and they're doing amazing things. But w what he cautioned me about was, but not everybody in the community can afford $10 bread. Yeah. And so when you come out and that becomes the narrative of your community of look at this amazing $10 loaf of bread, look at the, these amazing clothes that are $250 for a pair of jeans. Look at this amazing restaurant that's going to cost your family of four six hundred dollars to eat at if that becomes the prevailing narrative what we're also signaling to people is that they can't afford to live in this community yeah not our intention at all sure we want to support these local businesses and they are amazing and they're so important to our community but he really stretched my brain into that empathy and yeah. in understanding like i can say something and i a hundred percent well-meaning but if i don't have the empathy and the understanding of my community to say i might be saying that to people and they look at that as exclusion 
Yeah. That's important. And I think when you said it makes all of us better and it makes our community better, I think part of it is it leads us to understand our community in new and different ways. Because I may never, I, I, my in my circles, I may never talk to people like yeah. that. But here they are on stage saying, this is my experience and this is why I think that I do. And now I walk out and say 40% of our population here are people from that demographic. That's yeah. a big deal. Yeah, so and we have to honor people's experiences. Yep. Just, and I take it back to this, just like when I invited Ryan Kelly. He represents a big portion of the community I live in. Mm-hmm. So if you're saying to him that he's not welcome there, what are you saying to the people in the community that you say you're fighting for? And that's the point. I think people miss that. Just like when I said the comment earlier about the left versus right and the left was supposed to be the good guy. It's not because I think that only left people are good. It's because growing up, that's what I was taught, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. I was taught that it was like this left versus right and the left is good. It good wants versus everybody. evil, yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so I'm saying if, if you're saying that you're the good, you can't wish death on me. <laughs> Yeah. It doesn't work like that. Right. So, of course, and, and I, so I just want to make sure I say that because I want all people to come. Like, I I truly, I've enjoyed talking to people who have different views, right? Mm-hmm. I have some conservative views. I mean, I enjoy talking to people who think differently and also are not afraid to be that lone wolf, right? Mm-hmm. I have no problem with that. So, back to what you were saying in regards to community. Yes, we teach people that they aren't welcome there based on... Um, the way we present things. Mm-hmm. And a, a lot of times it's unintentionally, right? Because we're just so excited about this bread because we ate, mm-hmm. the bread was good. Mm-hmm. We want everybody to enjoy it, not realizing that everybody can't. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And again, just to clarify, because I don't want anybody taking words out of context, sure. you should absolutely do that. You should promote local businesses. Yes. You should support them. They are amazing. Yes. It's just a greater understanding of our community commands that that we have to understand how other people might be taking that because empathy, because of love, because of that leads to greater communities, because that leads us to maybe help people who need help yeah. in a better way down the road. Like it just makes everybody better when we expand that and we hear varying perspectives, varying opinions, and we have a more nuanced of exactly who we are because the, the the rose colored glasses yeah can a hundred percent love like it's not just ignorance or yeah. it's not just I'm I'm X Y Z and this place is beautiful and if you disagree I hate you it, it's just it's it's so important to wear the right kind of glasses and glasses that are you can see the good you can see the the challenges you can and you see may all have these to change things. and you, you have to change have the to glasses change. you may have to change the glasses right yep. try some different pair and the thing yep. is that's so interesting is that. It's really funny that you had to kind of preface that, right? Because we mm-hmm. have, because we know in this age, people will take one word, one sentence, and just yeah. run with it. Yeah. So I'm always thinking about, okay, I want to make sure I don't say this, but then also I have to be myself, mm-hmm. and I'm sharing again my experience. And because I remember one time, uh, one show, we did have, a, I did have a lady that commented that she didn't like the fact that people were saying things about Midland because. I, I don't remember what the, I think it was about societal expectations that people were were sharing some of their experiences of being a person of color or I think a woman, different things like that. Mm -hmm. And the person did not appreciate some of the things that were shared about Midland. And as I thanked her, of course, for giving feedback and sharing her perspective, I also just reminded her that people are there to share their experience. And if that's the experience, we want that. We want the truth. And so in no way am I ever going to dog out religion, people's politics, their city, where they live. But if I go into a city and every time I've gone into that city, I get stopped by a police officer that asks me, what are you doing here? That's my experience. I didn't get to experience the place with the good bread, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't feel comfortable to even go venture out to the bakery because I was questioned. We have to understand that again. People's experiences don't always align with ours, but that is the beauty of the -hmm. conversation. Yeah. One phrase I tell communities whenever I work with them is that people's perception of a place is limited by their experience of it. Yeah. In that we have a perception of where we live because we've experienced where we live and that has shaped us into our viewpoint, our perspective. 
And who are we to say that everyone has to have that same perspective? Yeah. Considering here in Bay City, we're 37,000 different people. Yeah. Like the assumption that everyone has that same perspective, not just on the city, but on life and social issues Unrealistic. and opinions. It's so completely impossible. Anybody that's ever been to a meeting with 10 people, five, like five people, two people, <laughs> yes. like, like anybody in those situations, you know how hard it is to get people aligned. aligned. And then you blow that up to a community of 37,000 yeah. people or 57,000 or 100,000 people, like you're looking at something impossible. And so there has to be a, an answer different than we all have to agree on this or else. Yeah. There, there has to be another way to work through that. And I think the primary way is through conversations like this. Yeah, yeah. People outside of, I'm just using Midland example because I live there. People outside of Midland think everybody there is rich or mm -hmm. racist or bougie and all these things. And I'm like, there's some really good people in Midland, like yep. some excellent, amazing people in Midland. And then there's some people that aren't so much mm -hmm. from my perspective. Welcome to every community, <laughs> every community in the entire, entire world. world. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So when people have these absolutes, yeah. I always like to challenge, is that realistic? Is that yeah. possible? Is that really the truth? And so, yeah, I don't know. I could go on about that, but that's okay. I think that's a great segue to, to something that you and I have talked about in the yeah. past in it, the importance of humility. Yes. In, in situations like that, I think the, the open door, the act of opening a door to the possibilities that these kind of communications present is humility. Yeah. And even if it's 1%, you're coming in with 1% of I might be wrong about this yeah. or even less for the people that kind of chafe at that. I might not be as right about this as I could be. Yeah. Or there's other perspectives that I don't, that I'm not aware of. And right. it's important for me to hear those so that not necessarily to change my mind. So it could even be to reaffirm my opinion. Sure. But you need the humility to be able to enter into this space to say, I'm open enough to say that I might not be 100% right yeah. about something. And that's a great opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Yes. The f Do you know when the first event is? The first date? January 9th. January 8th, I think. It's the 9th. We oh, changed it's the 9th? It. Yes, okay. we changed it. Because that was, a, that was an error. So I have to get... We actually have new flyers coming. Oh, do you? Okay, yes, cool. Because... Um, yeah, I don't like doing things on Mondays. <laughs> same, same. So first event is on Jan on January 9th. Where where is it going to be held? Tell me kind of the, so the, the hard details. Pierre, yep, the yeah. Pierre Marquette Station. Is that what you all yep. call it? Yep. And so at the Bay Area Community Foundation. And what's cool, too, is that we have our entertainment already, and he is a local guy. Awesome. Um, the Pesky Kid. Pesky Kid, Ben Champagne. What yes. a cool dude Ben Champagne is. Yeah, so I'm really excited because it's really interesting because – I tried to get him in Midland, and our schedule just didn't align. Yeah. He was traveling the world and just could not do it. And so I went back to him and said, hey. He put on a killer block party for the 3rd Street Star Bridge. That's what I heard. I wanted yeah. to come to it, but I was out of town myself. Man. <laughs> yeah. If I could go back in time and be as cool as Ben Champagne, I would, because that dude is cool. So I'm looking forward to that music part. On January 9th at the Pier Marquette Depot, that's 9th. I won't give you the the, the address because I'm looking at a bunch of numbers and I'm glazing. I'll put it in the caption. It's 1,000 Adams. I yeah, just know 1, that. Yeah, 1,000 Adams. I just know that because it just sticks yeah. out. I'm just not good with numbers. Google Maps, people. Yeah. <laughs> um, starts at 6 p.m. That's a pre-show. Entertainment, 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. is the live show. Are there tickets or can I just show up or how does that roll? So you can just show up. We do have, when you go to our website, when we start kind of advertising for it on the website, mm -hmm. you can go on to Eventbrite and we have just register. It's all free. Yeah. So nobody has to pay anything. We just like to keep track of our numbers because it is a smaller venue. Right. So we want to just make sure of that. It helps for planning. It helps for planning. If, if we go, okay, yeah. we got, got 100 people RSVP'd. We know there could be more. So yes. are we going to be able to? Yeah, yeah it just helps. Plus we'll, have, plus we'll have treats uh, at each one. So we want to get a number for that as well. So it does help. But yes. People can drop in. Very cool. What's your website before I forget to ask you? So it is tbv.org. So that is the Breaking Bread Village, 
tbbv.org. Beautiful. Aaron Patrice, I am so looking forward to the series here in Bay City. I'm going to be at every single one of the shows because, man, it, just some of the most important work. And, and I have so much respect for you. Oh, I appreciate it. I have it. so much respect for all the panelists yeah. that, that really come on and they, they're coming in and they're saying, you know what? I am willing to really show myself and express myself in this way because you it can, it man, terrifying in a lot of ways, and oh, yeah. they're willing to sit up there because they value the work too. And so, man, I I want to thank you. I want to thank Diane and the rest of the crew over at the Bay Area yeah, Community Foundation because without them, like you need support and you need somebody yeah. to invite you in and say, hey, we love this, and and they're the ones that did that. So, man, I'm looking forward to this work. Aaron Patrice, thank you so much for joining me. Today. Yes, thank you, Phil. Thank you, I appreciate it. And go Bay City. <laughs> You're awesome. Oh. Heck yeah.